this week we have good news, we have bad news, and I'm going to be kicking things off with my very favorite news, which is coming out of Texas with a fun and actually really helpful story about a father and his son and an Apple Watch. Now, this is a story of a young autistic man who had a tendency to talk too loud. And I could relate to this a bit because we have a couple of very loud talkers in this house who I have to pretty frequently remind to use indoor voices. I probably say indoor voice about 20 times a day, and that's probably not an exaggeration, but figuring out how to use that volume control on their voice is definitely a challenge for some people. And that was the challenge that this young man was facing throughout his entire life in Texas. And his father, who was a really quiet guy who appreciated silence, said that he was basically blessed with the loudest son in the world. And then one day he found out that there was an app on his Apple Watch and that that app, basically the app turns yellow or it flashes yellow if the sound is loud enough that it's a decibel that could damage hearing and it turns green if it is a quieter sound and so he showed this to his son and right away his son started speaking more quietly and so now all he has to do is flash his watch at his son to show him that it's turning yellow and his son's voice will get quieter and he said pretty quickly his son was speaking very, very quietly when he was inside the house, much to the happiness of the family dog who would always run out of the room and he would start speaking loudly. He said that this was something that he wanted to share with other families because he knows that it's not something that can be used by every autistic person out there or every family out there, but that it's something that some people struggle with. And he said in the article that I read in People Magazine that for that reason he wanted to share it because there's so many things that can help people even when they aren't made to help with disabilities and it can be hard to find them and so just by sharing them it can help other people. And the kids are here so it might, if you hear footsteps, that's what that is. The second story is an emotional one. When I saw that charges were being filed against three employees at a school in California, I was happy that the charges were being filed because I remember the story, but it was still heartbreaking to remember the story that happened about a year ago because it shouldn't have happened. It was last year around this time when a 13-year-old autistic boy was restrained by school employees at a school in California, I believe it was outside of Sacramento, for two hours in an illegal face-down position. Now, in a lot of states, Face down restraints are not legal. They're not how kids are supposed to be held because they're dangerous. And this boy was held face down in a prone position, as I said, for two hours. The reports I've read said that people actually changed out, changed out who was holding him and he ended up losing consciousness and throwing up. It wasn't until 25 minutes after he lost consciousness that the school employees called 911. He ended up dying, I believe it was two days later. He, he ended up passing away later on. It has taken a while, but charges have been filed against three of the school employees that were involved. One is the special ed teacher, one is the principal, and one is the school's executive director. And that is something that desperately needed to happen. This wasn't this hold wasn't a one-time thing that they had used this hold. It's said throughout the articles that I've read that it, they were consistently using dangerous holds on the kids that were in their care at the school, and it was a it was a private school for special needs children that should have known what they were doing. It cost this 13-year-old boy his life. People need to be held responsible and hopefully they will be in a court of law. In Athens, Alabama, there is a library program that sounds like a real blessing to the families in the area. It is in a dimly lit corner in a plain room that is away from the children's section, which tends to be louder, more brightly colored, just more of a sensory overload. They have an autism program once a week. It is called Welcome to the Spectrum Storytime, and it is a program that is designed to reach the autistic children who are living in the community. The storytime begins and ends with the same songs every week so that the children know that it's time to listen, but in between those songs they have different activities and songs, everything from twirling scarves to running through bubbles to playing with puppets. The director of youth services, Amanda Coleman, says, this is all about reaching the children where they are, 
one thing I've learned is if you meet one person with autism, then you've met one person with autism. That's it. Every single person living with autism is completely different and reacts completely differently. There's no one size fits all. Because of the library's outreach efforts, they won a $5,000 award for 2019. And Spectrum Storytime has been described as a model for how libraries can provide programs for people on the spectrum. Next up, let's talk about Elon Musk and what he said this week in a podcast. When I heard what he'd said in the podcast, my first thought was, is this just for attention? Is this just for publicity? It doesn't really seem like this is anywhere close to actually being a reality. Basically, Elon Musk said that he thought that his neural technology company Neuralink was going to solve schizophrenia and autism with a brain chip, an artificial intelligence brain chip that would be implanted in people's brain to record brain activity and potentially stimulate it. He called autism a disease and as you can imagine the response from the autism community has been varied. I appreciated the UK National Autistic Society's website which said autism is not an illness or a disease and cannot be cured. Often people feel being autistic is a fundamental aspect of their identity. He also said it may cure, he may cure schizophrenia with it. Honestly, when I was reading, reading about the Neuralink just at all, I just kept thinking, no, no, no. He said his eventual goal is to merge human consciousness with artificial intelligence. It's intended to address the existential risk associated with digital super intelligence. We will never be smarter than a digital supercomputer, so therefore if you cannot beat them, join them. I mean, I don't know. It, this is so out there that I think it's really impossible to respond to. Just. No, autism doesn't need to be cured. It is a different way of thinking. Just no. All I could think was, think of how buggy and hackable computers are today. Why would anyone want that in their brains? I just, I love technology, but I don't trust it enough to want it implanted into my brain. I, yeah. Anyways, moving on. I'm not going to linger too long on that. There is a study, this one was out of Brown University's Hanson Child Health Innovation Institute, and it's looking at biomarkers that could indicate that a child is autistic as young as one month. And this was well before other more obvious symptoms are apparent. They said that their initial research suggested that even a cry of a one-month-old infant could have the potential to predict whether or not they would later be autistic. Biomarkers measure the basic processes that are at the root of higher function symptoms. So for instance, tracking a child's eye movements can reveal their capacity for social attention. Honestly, when I was reading this, I kept thinking that this was kind of what we saw with Tessie, that she didn't want to look at people even when she was one month old. It was really clear that she looked away from people and that she preferred to, she didn't mind looking at things, but if she saw a face close to her or anywhere, she was looking away from that face. So I found that to be really, really interesting. They said that when a caregiver points or directs their gaze at a ball, most children turn to focus, which is called joint attention. And when someone's speaking, children typically look at the person's face or mouth. Yet children with developmental disorders like autism often use their social attention in different ways. So that is extremely interesting. I do really feel like that's kind of what we saw with Tessie, maybe on a more extreme level than some people see or maybe just because we were really looking for it because of the experience that we had had with Maggie and Sadie even. Anyways that is it for today. If you like this video we'd love it if you'd give it a thumbs up and if you're interested in all things autism we'd love it if you'd hit subscribe and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye!